we can start now. Yep. Okay. okay. All right. Okay, welcome to Indonesia Project Special Webinar on Global Development and Health. My name is Arian Topatundro. I convene this series with Nur Kamala Mulyani and Ruth Nikijulu. We acknowledge the first Australians and pay our respect to elders past, present, and emerging. We are grateful for the support from the Australian National University and the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. We have run this series for more than one year now. We have invited observers, academics, private sectors, NGO representatives, as well as policymakers to discuss the many aspects of COVID-19 and the economy. Today, we have another very special session with three distinguished guests, Professor Mari Pangestu, Professor Tiki Pangestu, and Professor Hal Hill. Professor Hal Hill will chair the session, and so I will let him introduce Ibu Mari and Pak Tiki, but let me say something briefly about Hal. Ooh. Hal Hill is the HW Arn Professor Emeritus of Southeast Asian Economies at ANU. He is an author of 20 books and hundreds of journal articles. And uh, he is a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences uh, in Australia and has been an official guest of the Republic of Indonesia under its Presidential Friends of Indonesia program. Last year, Hal was appointed an officer of the Order of Australia. Well, thank you so much, Pak Hal, for accepting our invitation. Now, uh, uh, over to you. Silakan, uh, uh, Pak. Thank you very much, Acho. Thank you very much, Acho. And good morning from an unusually misty and damp Canberra. Uh, I, I'm Hal Hill, and it's my great pleasure and honor to uh, be in conversation with our two uh, illustrious uh, guests and to be part of the, the mighty ANU Indonesia project webinar series. Uh, it's a case of good morning to one of them, Professor Tiki Pangestu in Singapore, and good evening to the other guest, Professor Mari Pangestu in Washington, D.C. Uh, Tarima Kasi Banyak, Mari, because it's pretty late already in D.C., so thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's a very special session because uh, we're going to talk about the big issues of, of the day in the world, and both of our guests are highly qualified to do so coming from their complementary backgrounds of health and economics. They actually, the guests actually need no introduction, uh, but I'm gonna, I can't resist the opportunity to talk about them a little. So uh, professors Mari Pangestu and Tiki Pangestu, they're actually a brother sister combination. And I'm guessing this may have even been the first occasion they've been in a public uh, event like this. So thank you very much. Uh, let me introduce them briefly. Uh, Mari is currently the managing director of the World Bank and its headquarters in charge of development policy and partnerships. Uh, Mari's had a remarkable career with many uh, highlights. Uh, she served for a decade in the president SBY cabinets, initially as trade minister, then as minister for tourism and creative economies. In addition, she's had a stellar academic career uh, both at the University of Indonesia, where she's taught for many years, uh, and at the wonderful Center for Strategic and International Studies in Jakarta, where she was for a period also executive director. Uh, one of the really salient features of Mary's work is that she covers so many areas. She works across the field in economics and related public policy, international economics, macroeconomics, uh, and living standards, industrial, industrialization, and so on. She's also played a wonderful role in nurturing many younger Indonesian academics, and especially younger women academics. Uh, I speak from personal experience. She sent quite a few to me. <laughs> Uh, now, so that's Mari. Tiki, uh, Tiki has also had a remarkably distinguished career as an academic and international public servant. He's currently a visiting professor at the Yong Lu Lin School of Medicine at the National University of Singapore. For 13 years, he was at the headquarters of the World Health Organization, running its research policy uh, and cooperation department. Prior to that time, Tiki was a longtime professor of biomedical sciences at the University of Malaya in Kuala Lumpur. 
Uh, he specializes in infectious diseases. And could there be a more topical issue <laughs> at the moment? Uh, under that umbrella, he has very wide interests, uh, global health challenges and governance, universal health coverage, uh, biosecurity and pandemic preparedness, vaccines and vaccine hesitancy and much else. Uh, he's highly published in leading uh, scientific journals, more than 250 papers, uh, 12 books and many reports. So I won't, uh, I won't embarrass them any further, except just to note uh, that there is a special Canberra connection, uh, and we're very proud to have that connection with them. Uh, they are both uh, ANU graduates. Uh, Mari graduated with a master's, uh, with a bachelor's and master's and got an honorary doctorate. Tiki with, uh, with an undergraduate degree and then a PhD as well. Uh, in fact, uh, going further, Mari is a graduate of Canberra High School, and I think Mari even Hughes Primary School, and uh, Tiki is a graduate of Deakin High School. Just for those of you who don't know, the reason for their Canberra connection uh, is the fact that their father, uh, Dr. Pang Lai Kim, uh, a legendary figure in Indonesia, universally uh, loved and uh, known as pa Pang, was uh, appointed to the ANU Indonesia project in the mid 1960s. In fact, the first um, Indonesia appointment to the project. Okay, so that's the introduction. Uh, now we get on with the show. <clears throat> so the format is, uh, is going to be a, a webinar and conversation. My job is to basically, uh, basically just sort of raise some questions and considerations for Mary and Vicky, and then time permitting, we'll at the end, we'll have some time for Q&A and for chat. So let's, uh, let's open it up. And once again, uh, thank you so much, Amari and Tiki, for joining us. We know you're both extremely busy. Uh, so could I start, please, by a general question uh, to both of you, but each of you coming from your different disciplines and backgrounds. Can you give us a, an outline of the current global situation as you see it, Mari mainly for the, the economics of it and um, Tiki mainly for the, the health and, and, and uh, pandemic issues. Within that, of course, there are a lot of sub issues to look at. So I'll leave it to you to think about how you want to talk about it. For example, you know, questions like, why have there been such variable outcomes in both economics and in vaccine preparedness um, and managing the COVID across countries? How do we address global inequities between the rich and the poor worlds, both living standards and also health preparedness uh, and the global poverty outlook? And, and another important development just this week has been the important statement by the four heads of the World Bank, WHO, uh, IMF and WTO. So within that broad question, I'll leave it to you how you want to answer it. Uh, Mari, could I invite you to speak first, please? And then we'll go to Tiki. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Hal, and thank you for your uh, kind introduction. Uh, indeed, uh, we have lots of um, uh, ties uh, with the, not just with Canberra, but also with the uh, ANU Indonesia project, as, as you mentioned. So it, I think it's our uh, pleasure, both of us, um, to be uh, at this webinar. So if uh, your question is to ask me about the global, uh, current global economic situation, uh, I, I think if you look at global uh, growth projections, they're actually looking quite good in the sense that last year, the whole world was in global recession, uh, the worst global recession we've had since uh, World War II. Uh, this year, especially as after the first quarter, we, we have seen an upward revision uh, of the uh, near-term recovery and economic rebound. And in fact, uh, I think the pr prediction now is that the recovery is going to be faster and higher than uh, compared to, to many other global recessions that have happened in the last decades. Um, and, and even the World Bank, we, are, we will be coming out with our global economic uh, projections uh, next week, actually. Uh, I, so I can't give you the numbers yet, but I can give you the, the direction of travel, if you like, uh, to, to say it that way. Uh, it, uh, we projected that global economic growth would be 4% in 2021 in January. Uh, it's likely to be much higher than that. It's going to be higher than, than uh, 5%. And this is in line with the uh, IMF uh, World Economic Outlook that came up came out in uh, April, 
And a lot has to do with, uh, you know, the very, very uh, high growth uh, rebound recovery of the U.S. economy. U.S. economy is growing at six to seven percent, the highest ever since, I think, uh, in the 1950s. So uh, that's kind of the good news uh, that there's this uh, rebound uh, that is sharper and, and faster than before. And even trade um, uh, in goods, commodity prices, they all have seemed uh, to, to recover. Um, but... Uh, the bad news, if you like, especially for developing countries, is that the recovery has been very uneven. Mm -hmm. So the upward revision is being experienced mostly in advanced economies uh, and some uh, of the larger uh, uh, emerging market economies, especially uh, China. Um, and uh, the, the, the upward revision is very much linked with, uh, you can guess this, a better rollout of vaccinations. Um, and size and length of the stimulus. So these two factors, uh, obviously with advanced economies on average having a fiscal stimulus of about 16% of GDP compared to developing countries of 4% of GDP, uh, a, a lot of difference in, in the ability to, to prop up uh, the, the households as well as, as the firms. And the vaccine rollout uh, is, is uh, obviously key. So uh, I will let Tiki talk more about the vaccines, but I, I think um, everybody kind of knows this number, this inequality of uh, vaccine vaccination uh, between advanced countries and developing countries is very, very stark. I mean, the US right now, uh, we are at 41.4% of the population and by summer, they expect that it's going to be 60 to 70%. Um, and Europe is also similarly at 20 to 30%. Uh, many parts of Af Africa are still only uh, at 1%. Uh, Indonesia is faring a little bit better at 10%. So there's a very, very sharp uh, inequality in, uh, in, in the vaccine um, access. Uh, so uh, I, I think that's, that's kind of the first uh, piece of, of differences uh, in, in once you look at the global uh, growth and why uh, the drivers of the differences. And I think the other... Uh, uh, think you know because we, we, if you put a development lens, there are two or three other uh, 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 aspects to the economic situation, which highlights the increased inequality uh, part of the of the picture. So one one uh, aspect is the is inequality between countries, uh, despite countries having a positive growth this year, uh, you. What, what has happened is that you had a contraction and depending how deep you, you fell last year, to come out of it and get back to 2019 levels is gonna take you a couple of years. So 60% uh, uh, of uh, emerging markets, by, even by 2022, are still gonna be at a lower level of per capita income um, compared to 2019. Uh, and uh, they will, be on a slower trajectory uh, growth uh, even after that. So uh, uh, meanwhile, advanced economies get, uh, can get back to uh, per capita income uh, probably this year, uh, by this year. And then um, depending on what happens in each of these countries, they can uh, grow uh, faster. So the, the disparity, uh, uh, the catch up, uh, and the disparity and the catch up is going to get wider. And then within countries, we know that the, the uh, pandemic has had a much, much bigger impact on the poor and on, on women and children. So uh, it, the, the latest uh, poverty number that we have, our poverty assessment is that by the end of this year, uh, the number of extreme poor is going to reach 150 million. Uh, last year, it was uh, estimated to reach about 120 million. Uh, this year is going to go up to 150 million. And poverty has not increased since 98. Last year was the first time poverty went up. And you know we, we do surveys of household and firms, and you are seeing 33% uh, per, have stopped work, 61% 61, 61 experienced a total drop in income. And I think the really scary thing is the impact uh, on human capital, learning losses in children. Uh, which would be irreversible uh, uh, and, and children not getting immunized because health, health uh, funding is going to the pandemic, uh, leading to uh, probably higher prevalence uh, and then nutrition and food being also scarce. 
all this is going to have um, uh, increased stunting and, in, and learning losses. Uh, the World Bank has this number called the learning poverty. What is the learning poverty? It's the ability of a 10 year old child uh, to read and understand a simple text. And uh, before the pandemic, the learning crisis was 53%. So 53% of uh, 10 year old children could not read or write, uh, understand a simple text. In Africa, it's 90%. We predict that uh, because of the learning losses and the pandemic, uh, this learning poverty is going to go up to, go up to 63%. So this issue on human capital. On, um, on gender, uh, the, the, this crisis has impacted women much more uh, than men. There is a, a definite gender differential impact, whether it's gender-based violence, whether it's not getting uh, maternal uh, and, and uh, health services, uh, early child marriages have increased, greater, greater loss of jobs and women owned businesses are, have been impacted more. And like after what happened with the Ebola crisis, uh, you know, once, once schools reopen, there's a, a quite a large dropout rate and, and girls are, are less likely to go back to school. So these are uh, really uh, some of the, the issues. So uh, just to end on the global economic prospects, what's the, the upside, uh, sorry, what's the downside? The downside to that rather rosy global picture is if you had a greater, um, uh, a, a more uh, variance, more wave, a second or third waves, uh, as we seem to be experiencing, uh, and uh, also uh, financial market stress uh, because of re, uh, because of um, reassessments of growth prospects, uh, potential corporate defaults. Uh, we have uh, also seen signs of food insecurity. Food prices are up by 20%. Um, and uh, some, uh, some uh, countries, some uh, pockets of population are not getting access to food. And in the longer term, you do have the climate risk and the geopolitical uh, risks. Um, and, the, and the rollout of vaccines, obviously, is, is a key. Uh, on the upside, uh, there could be a faster end of the pandemic, but I, I don't think so. I will let my brother uh, address that. You know, SARS came and went, right? That was, I re still remember early 2020, we were talking about, oh yeah, it's going to come. It was kind of confined to Asia and then it'll go away. Uh, and I guess that's what the, uh, the, the previous uh, administration thought too. But uh, certainly that didn't happen. Um, so a faster end of the pandemic or a better control of the pandemic is, is the upside scenario and spillovers from major economies. So this is where, you know, how would you position yourself if you were Indonesia? Spillovers from what's happening in the US uh, with trade growth recovering and, uh, and so on and, and potentially investment flows. Uh, uh, you could uh, see a, a synchronized, uh, potential synchronized economic boom. That's kind of the, the upside. I don't know whether you want me to stop here or you want me to talk a little bit about, uh, so uh, what does this mean for global cooperation? Um, Mary, yeah. I'd, like, I'd like you to keep on talking for the full 90 minutes, but, uh, but, but if you don't mind, let me come back to you because there's lots of really interesting points to think about, such a comprehensive overview. So let me come back to these issues shortly, Mary, and now may I invite uh, Tiki to give us an overview on the health issues. Thanks, Tiki. Yeah, muted. Thank you very much, Hal. Uh, it's a pleasure to come back virtually to my alma mater and uh, to Canberra. Uh, I spent 11 years of my life there, so still have a very strong attachment to, to Canberra. Um, okay, let me try to address your uh, questions here. Let me begin with sort of a macro view of the current global situation. And I'll just make four points here. The first point is that the situation remains serious and, as Mari mentioned, also uneven with regards to the pandemic. Europe and North America are opening up as Asia birds. Latin America is simmering and Africa is holding its breath. So that's the first point, serious and uneven. Secondly, there is growing concern about the impact of the variants that are appearing and spreading all over the world. Third, and as Mari mentioned, vaccines are obviously having an impact. We can see this in the UK, we can see this in Israel, 
We can see this in the US. We even see it in some Latin American countries. So that's the third, third point. The final point on, on, on the micro level is what we can, what is actually the topic of the seminar is uh, inequity in access to, to, to vaccines. And this is due partly to this issue of vaccine nationalism that we'll, I'm sure, return to. So that's the big macro picture. You also asked me to sort of comment on what might be the variables that are contributing to the current picture. And once again, I have four points here. Uh, firstly, is the slow reaction and response on the part of many governments due to a large range of reasons. And that is being seen now with the surges in certain countries. So that's one variable, slow response. Secondly, obviously, national capacity in the many different countries, especially the low and lower middle income countries, to deal with the surges, partly due to complacency that had set in in some of these countries because they previously seemed to be successful. India is a good example. Vietnam is another good example. Thailand is another good example. So that's related to their national capacity and related to the third variable, which is political will and commitment, which unfortunately is missing in, in some of these countries at the highest level. Uh, India would be uh, a good example uh, of that. And the fourth variable, which in my mind is actually one of the most important ones is social capital, weak social capital. The population, the people in the community are simply not compliant, are simply not cognizant of their social responsibility so that their behavior endangers the whole population. So those are four variables that, you know, in my view from a health perspective leads to that. Your second subtopic is how do we address vaccine inequity? To me, having followed this debate, pragmatically, practically, for me, the solution is to increase local production in addition to provision of vaccines from developed countries. COVAX, obviously, you know, Mari knows a lot more about that, but I believe we need to focus on improving uh, local production. This is not going to be easy because some of these vaccines are technologically complex. You have to have production facilities, you have to have technical support, uh, you need to assure quality and you need to deal with regulatory requirements. But, you know, I, 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 I read somewhere that, that actually uh, many countries in, in the developing world actually have good manufacturing capacity. You know, I mean, the obvious one obviously is India, everybody talks about India, but also even countries like Pakistan, Bangladesh, South Africa, Indonesia, even Senegal, they have that capacity. So if we can uh, promote that, that will help in ensuring self-sufficiency in, in the future. So that's the first dimension, increase local production in addition to uh, uh, international uh, help in providing vaccines. The second one is better global vaccine governance. Okay, and you know the vaccine nationalism has really politicized this this whole issue. So we need to sort of go back to the era of vaccine diplomacy in the 1960s. You know, go back to the true spirit of international cooperation, which is driven uh, by good science, good evidence, which is the, the third reason I believe it's been such a problem. You know, in, 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 in that regard, I'd like to remind you that in the 1960s, there was wonderful cooperation between the Russians and the Americans to develop the polio vaccine, to develop the smallpox vaccine and deploy it. And that led to amazing achievements in public health, like eradication of smallpox, in 1978, the almost eradication of polio. That was vaccine diplomacy at its very best. 
but in a way that's gone gone to the dogs because as we heard recently the russians are actually using you know uh, subterfuge to try to impugn uh, the validity of the western developed vaccines through social media and all that kind of thing so we need to restore restore you know uh, good vaccine diplomacy and have better vaccine uh, governance and i think we can we we'll go back later when you had a question on on global architecture your final subtopic was on global poverty i think uh, i'm not this is not my area of, of expertise uh, mari is already uh, alluded to the many dimensions of this all all i i i have noted here is that in in 2015 uh, 10% of the world was uh, in poverty and was projected to actually be down to 7.5% by 2021 okay then covid hit and what i've seen on the latest production that uh, that's actually not going to be reached 7.5% in fact it's going to go back up to 10% so i leave it at that sorry to be uh, long winded about that uh, th thanks very much, uh, Atiki. Uh, you weren't long-winded at all. It was so much important material to get across and we appreciate it. So standing back from both of you, I get this, as you'd expect, I suppose, a nuanced picture. St definitely some signs of hope. Uh, Mari's, you know, the global economy are picking up um, and, and Tiki, you know, the vaccine rollouts is occurring in some places, but also lots of concern. And the two areas of concern I hear particularly are the inequality both between and within countries and also related, therefore, the need for, for global cooperation to address these global issues. Of course, we could have a separate session as we have in the past on climate change and the same sort of issues in a way global cooperation would, would arise. L let me then follow up, if I may, with another general question, which perhaps fleshes out some of the point, and you can flesh out further points of your own if you like. The sort of big issue I'm thinking of is standing back uh, when we get through this, if we get through it, how is the world going to look both globally and locally? Um, what have we learned from this crisis? What will be different? I mean, th the capacity for human nature to learn from, you know, catastrophic events, I I'm still a bit of an optimist. We still seem to be able to learn from them, maybe, not always. So um, how will the world look in maybe two or three years, assuming we've, we've, we've got this thing under control? And that does lead directly to the issue which you both touched on, which is this need for global cooperation. I thought, Tiki, you really put it uh, passionately and so well, you know, the 60s when smallpox and polio, you could mention also, by the way, food production, the Green Revolution and all that sort of stuff. So uh, can we talk a bit about what the world might look like, what we've learned and this global cooperation issue um, in a fractured world, unfortunately, where the two global superpowers, for example, aren't exactly getting on very well. Uh, how do we think about it? And I suppose there's a specific issue with both sectors, both with health and with economics. And so in the case of economics, you know, it's the role of international institutions like the IMF, World Bank, regional bodies like ADB. And in the case of health, WHO clearly is central. Fortunately, the US administration has rejoined the WHO. So could I ask you both to talk about this sort of looking forward a bit and what's needed? Uh, Tiki, could I start with you this time, please? Um, sort of what will the world look like? What have we learned? Uh, what sort of cooperation should we be focused on? Thank you. Thank you, Hal. Uh, so I'm going to start by addressing uh, the question of what are the lessons learned? Um, I think the big uh, uh, message here is what I mentioned before. Speed of reaction is absolutely central to this. And uh, within that, there are maybe three uh, sub highlights that I would like to mention. The first one is at the public health level, the important dimensions of testing, tracing, treating, and isolating. Okay, at the public health, at the coal face kind of level. So that's the first one. The second one, it has to be complemented with proven public health interventions. In Indonesian, it's called PROCES, okay? Process Kesehatan, right? And this is the 3M. Wear a mask, maintain safe distancing, and hand hygiene. So that's the second one public health interventions, continue that together with the more public health interventions. And of course, 
more recent times, the deployment of uh, vaccines. The third thing that I want to mention is actually uh, at a so slightly higher level, very wonderfully expressed by Vivian Balakrishnan, uh, Singapore Minister for Foreign Affairs. And he said that the lessons that has been learned and also obviously applying to Singapore are to deal with the pandemic in the future. Remember these three things. What you need is first of all, a good responsive healthcare system with all the accoutrements, including good informatics, for example. Secondly, you need good governance. You need a central command inter-ministry uh, task force like Singapore that has done, uh, which coordinates all the different levels. Obviously, it's easy to say for Singapore, but in Indonesia, it would include central government coordinating closely with the provinces and also even with the districts. So good governance, a single objective cooperation, no conflicts, no confusion, no contradictory messages. Okay, good healthcare, good governance. And thirdly, I come back to this social capital. That really is the linchpin of Singapore's success. I mean, you, you know, I mean, I'm, I want to be politically correct. I'm not going to say that Singaporeans are obedient, but I would say that Singaporeans are pretty good at complying with government directives in terms of the key public uh, health measures. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of the lessons learned. And obviously it depends on, on leadership, okay? On political will and commitment and governments committing uh, uh, resources. And on this issue of social capital, I was just looking this morning at the news that the current problem in Malaysia is mainly due to people simply flouting all those rules under the new lockdown that they imposed uh, uh, yesterday. The sub-question that you had uh, under this lessons learned was around um, what might be needed moving forward in terms of the global uh, architecture. Okay, and I just want to mention here the uh, the report that was released about I think ten days ago, the Independent Panel on Pandemic Preparedness and Response, chaired by Helen Clark and Alan Johnson Silly from Liberia, and one of the key recommendations is with respect to to global architecture, a stronger role for the WHO. It needs to be more focused. It needs to be more independent, especially in terms of funding. And more importantly, it needs to have more authority. For me, the panel's most important recommendation is that WHO should be free to publish information rapidly without prior consultation with national governments. And it should have the authority to send experts when they sense a potential pandemic arriving, okay, they should have the authority to send experts into the country rapidly and with the right of access. Now, I was quite taken with that recommendation. Personally, I feel it's aspirational. Personally, I think the countries are not going to accept it. But at least make that statement, okay. Um, they also, uh, in terms of global architecture, Architecture, the panel suggested the formation of a global health threats council. They also suggested additional mechanisms as part of a future architecture to do better surveillance, to, do, uh, to have a platform for vaccine development, diagnostics and, and therapeutics, and a platform for financing those uh, activities. So that's on global architecture, but you know, the idea of having more new multilateral organizations. Uh, I, I'm not particularly enthusiastic about that. Your final sub-question on that was on global trade policy and cooperation. Now, this is obviously uh, Mari's area, but you basically know the, the current controversy around wavering of uh, intellectual property rights. You know, we can have a whole session uh, on this, but I think intellectual property right wavering is not a short-term solution. I'm more in favor of uh, ramping up local production. Uh, and it's not just about intellectual property in terms of trade policy, but it's ensuring supply chains and, and raw materials for vaccine production to occur domestically. 
So over to you, Hal. Uh, thanks very much, Tiki. Again, really fascinating remarks and so much to sort of chew over. I'm struck by this comment people make that we're only as strong as our weakest link, and that is surely central to understanding the public health issue. Uh, incidentally, I saw also, I don't know whether this is correct, but that the funding for the WHO is actually less than that of a major a major rich country metropolitan hospital. I don't know whether that's true or not, but if it is, it's a sad commentary. Um, yeah, it, it's true, Hal, that the annual budget of the WHO is about $2 billion US dollars. Mm. That's the budget for a medium-sized hospital in yeah. the United States. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and the, the remark you made on, on the Clark Sirleaf report, I haven't read it in detail, but just seen excerpts. It's right. really important, isn't it? We have to have aspirational statements, even if yeah, sure, sure. Some countries won't actually uh, yeah, join straight away. Okay, thank you very much, Tiki. Now, Murray, let me now pass over to you, please, and similar sort of broad set of issues uh, on general economics and development and so on. Thank you, Murray. Uh, yeah, let me start with lessons learned. Uh, I think uh, on the on the health response, I think uh, Tiki has said uh, a number of things about the lessons learned. You know the importance of coordination uh, and whole of government uh, approach, um, and political will and political leaderships and, and containment and so on. I would just add one more, and he mentioned social capital. Uh, I I think the role of communities and the role of communications would be another thing that I would add. And that's definitely, you know, when we look at all the countries that we will we are working in, um, uh, the, the definition of success is also uh, defined by how good they are at communicating, uh, you know, the information, being transparent, uh, and building trust, right, uh, with, with the society and with the community. Uh, and I think I just wanted to mention something on vaccines. Uh, uh, the inequality of vaccines uh, is one thing. It, it's, you know, we talked a lot about the access, getting the access uh, to vaccines. Uh, and here, I just want to mention uh, two or three things related to that. One is that it's one thing to, to get the access to the vaccines. So procurement and financing of the vaccines is one, one aspect of it. Uh, but you need to be able to deploy safely the, and distribute the vaccines safely in the countries. And uh, this is something that should not be underestimated, obviously. Uh, we have heard, already heard about vaccines expiring just because the country could, could not um, put, the, put it in the arms of people. So the World Bank is working in 140 countries together. This is one of the positive things. We are working with WHO, UNICEF, Gavi um, and, and, and partners on the ground to uh, assess whether a country is ready or not uh, to distribute vaccines. And it's, it's the infrastructure, it's whether you have the health workers uh, to uh, deliver uh, the, the vaccines. Do you have the systems of registration and uh, be able to monitor and have surveillance of the people that get vaccinated and communications. Uh, because there's so much vaccine hesitancy and misinformation. So if you don't have uh, these things, then uh, uh, you, you, you may not be able to even deliver uh, the vaccines on the ground. So I think that's another aspect of inequality. So if you don't address that, you are going to have uh, you know, slow uh, vaccine rollout uh, because you just can't uh, deliver it. So a lot of attention needs to be paid to that. Um, and we are uh, uh, addressing, trying to address uh, that gap. And I think the interesting finding is that countries, um, countries actually, uh, uh, you know, we, we've done a, a survey of the 100, we started doing this back in November, out of the 140 countries, actually all of them have a national vaccination plan, they've identified who should get vaccinated. Uh, but only half have trained their workers and less mm -hmm. than half have actually got good communications strategy. Mm -hmm. So this is really clearly uh, the big gaps uh, that need to be addressed. And then on the supply side, Tiki mentioned uh, about, uh, uh, let me mention the trade issue and the IPR issue here. Uh, I, I agree with him that the IPR issue is only one part uh, and maybe a small part and a longer term issue uh, of, of the waiver and in fact, the waiver is already there. It's more about how can you uh, make it 
easier to use the waiver. But even if you have the, 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 I, the possibility of using the IPR, if you don't have the technology, you don't have the manufacturing capability, you still wouldn't be, or the investment uh, to come up with the, the facility, you will not still not be able to manufacture. So um, if you look at the op-ed that was produced by the four institutions, they actually talk about how uh, there is a plan to invest an additional vaccine production capacity of 1 billion doses. Uh, and it is intended to diversify, diversify production in regions which already have manufacturing capabilities. So in Africa, it would be South Africa and Senegal. In, in Asia, it would probably be Indonesia, Thailand. And then in uh, so South America, it would be Brazil, Mexico, Argentina. So existing manufacturing capability, how do you beef that up with technology transfer, uh, a sharing of the, um, uh, uh, the, the uh, know-how um, and making sure that trade can flow, right? Uh, both on the import and export side, uh, in, in the raw material, including the raw materials, as well as not having the export restrictions. Because one of the things about the IPR waiver, the current uh, regime, you can, they, they waiver it for uh, the, uh, public health use in your country, but you can't export it, or you can only export it with very, very, very great difficulty. So uh, that that uh, uh, needs to be uh, uh, addressed. So I think, uh, that, that needs global cooperation and multilateral institutions to agree. And this is, uh, I think, one of the, one of the, the push uh, by the four, um, by WTO, WHO, World Bank, and the IMF. Um, and on, on trade restrictions, it's not just vaccines, it's also the medical supplies, the therapeutics, the oxygen, <laughs> uh, and food. Yeah, I would put food in there because um, food insecurity uh, in, in the first half of last year and food prices going up with food restrictions was potentially going to become an issue. It didn't become an issue, uh, fortunately, but it can certainly uh, become an issue. I think the other things that I would uh, say uh, outside of, outside of uh, the health response, what did we learn about uh, the pandemic and the economic impact? Uh, I think we learned a lot about uh, uh, various things about pandemic preparedness. So this, uh, there's like five or six uh, expert groups on pandemic preparedness uh, at the moment, including the one uh, Tiki mentioned, uh, Helen Clark. Uh, pandemic preparedness is not just a health issue, but the moment you have a pandemic, you have lockdown and you have uh, people not having jobs and losing income. So how do you deploy a health emergency? How do you uh, develop uh, how do you have a social protection uh, system that will uh, put about, uh, have a social safety net system? How do you keep the lights on uh, in, 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 uh, from micros to medium sized uh, enterprises? Um, and uh, how do you keep uh, food supplies uh, flowing? So in, in, in many cases, there were also disruptions in food supply. And here, I think the lesson learned, a couple of lessons learned. I think one is the importance of data and systems. And, and, the, and the role of digital. Uh, so uh, countries that actually had a good uh, social protection system and data uh, were able to quickly deploy uh, and scale up and uh, broaden their social protection system. Like India is an example because India already had a, so, uh, a digital ID that was linked to the bank account uh, linked to, uh, to the mobile phone. So they, we could actually deploy very quickly in, in India, but in other countries, you have no data. Uh, how do you do it quickly? So I think the, the big learning uh, is how do we now uh, have the data and build up the systems and make them adaptable so that you, you need it for health to deliver vaccine. You also need it to deliver social protection. You also need it to deliver uh, skills upgrading systems or uh, support for the informal sector. How do you uh, set up these systems? So we are working uh, very hard with many countries to be able to set this up. You know, in, for, in the, for instance, in the case of Indonesia, we had quite a good uh, functioning uh, cash transfer program. If you remember, it started in 2005 by name, by address. But guess what? They discovered, I think when they were gonna uh, deploy the system, it was outdated. It had not been uh, updated for the last five years. So keeping it updated was another thing. And then we've had lots of discussions. If you want to register people, do you do people come and self-register, or do people 
or does the government uh, enforce it from uh, birth, from the census or from the birth records or from uh, voting records or whatever? You know, this is a, a lot of uh, uh, discussion on that. And the moment you have data, and the government has the data, uh, it should be used for the right purpose. But the issue of privacy and the use of data, who gets to use the, the data becomes another big issue. Uh, and the final thing, maybe a few, two, two other things, if I may, uh, in terms of learning, I think the other learning is uh, uh, we are very uh, uh, in a panic when we are in a crisis. We want to quickly do uh, responses, but you can do the wrong response and cause harm. So uh, you have to have a do no harm uh, mindset. Yeah, uh, You can introduce policies that are either very difficult to unroll uh, uh, in, in the future or actually uh, leads to harm. I'll just give you one example. If you give subsidy uh, for people not to pay their electricity bill or not to pay their rent, but then you don't actually support the landlords or the utility, uh, uh, they're gonna go bankrupt. And then at the time when you recover, there's no more electricity company. That, that's just to give you an extreme uh, example, right? Uh, and then the other lesson is while you're doing the emergency and short-term response, you should keep it, have an eye on the long term. So while you're doing the emergency health uh, program, uh, you should be already focusing on strengthening uh, the longer term health system and uh, uh, even uh, uh, making it more resilient. You know, the, this uh, idea of a one health system uh, is very important. You know, I, I, as a trade minister, I went through the bird flu. And at that time, we already uh, kind of knew about the zoonotic nature of these pandemics, that it goes from animal uh, to human. And therefore, you know, there's an ecosystem kind of issue. And then there's the way you should be designing your markets. Uh, but two years later, we forgot everything and uh, everything went back to business as usual. So this time around, how, how can you make sure that uh, you, you do uh, pay attention to the, the fact that all these pandemics have been zoonotic in nature? Um, and on, on just a few, uh, uh, if I may just close on, on the global cooperation question, I think uh, on, on vaccines, uh, uh, we made, uh, the four institutions have made a very strong call that you cannot have economic recovery without the vaccine rollout. So this is really the key, you know, making sure that the excess vaccines, there's transparency around uh, uh, the, the supply of vaccines. Uh, no, there's not much transparency either from the private sector or from the buyers uh, about how much, we don't actually know how much vaccines uh, have been booked and how much is being produced uh, uh, to know how much therefore needs to be produced, right? That, that's the first kind of call for cooperation uh, by all. And then second, how do you uh, uh, go through a, a mechanism like COVAX so that you can have the equitable distribution and the concessional financing uh, and grants uh, that will finance the purchase. Uh, and uh, I, you the supply is an issue. So ramping up production uh, quickly uh, by uh, expanding existing fac facilities and, and the technology that needs to go with it and so on would be very key. Uh, and uh, not to forget that while uh, vaccines is not the silver bullet, you still need to do the triple T the containment and, and then all the uh, health uh, facilities. Uh, and I, I think um, if I may just close with, so I won't be able to explain it, uh, but all crises offer opportunities, mm -hmm. opportunities to build back better and to build back differently. Uh, so while you are doing short term, you need to focus also on the medium term. Uh, and this uh, means uh, better uh, responding to the COVID-19 uh, uh, economic and health crisis, as well as the climate crisis. So when you build back better, how do you, um, how do you design your policies? How do you design your fiscal stimulus uh, to, to do that? Uh, th this is the, the, the next big thing that, that we are focusing now on the recovery and growth. Not bad. Economists can actually learn about health. I am very impressed. <laughs> Our, our worlds are now uh, interacting, you know, uh, for a long time, our worlds were not interacting. Now it's like, <laughs> it's very good to say solve some, the health problem. I cannot solve my economic problem. It's very good to see some brotherly, sisterly cooperation as well. <laughs> Interchange. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, for again, uh, comments rich in content. Uh, 
I was just thinking actually the 50 billion dollars I think it is proposed for this uh, vaccine rollout sounds eye-watering uh, you know amount of money but actually it's not that much compared to the global losses during the crisis is it uh, yeah. uh, question but you, you don't have to answer but maybe we'll come back to it later um, you know the one of the encouraging features of the global economy this century has been quite a bit of convergence that is poorer countries growing faster than the richer countries especially Asia but for a decade also Africa and even parts of Latin America but uh, that figure you mentioned Murray the four percent versus 16 percent you know the fiscal stimulus is just so striking isn't it so the worry is that that convergence process except for countries like China and so on may be really halted permanently perhaps we'll come back to that uh, I want to just go one more round of my questions and then I better move aside I see questions already uh, already piling up uh, one by the way from the wonderful Hugh Patrick in New York uh, my mentor hi, hi Hugh but also I've got I see questions coming from Terry Hull and Titik Anas and maybe others. So, but let me do one more round of questions. It sort of covers what we've been talking about already a bit, but could you just focus a bit more directly on Indonesia, since a lot of our audience is from Indonesia, interested in Indonesia, uh, and perhaps in, in comparative Southeast Asian context too. One of the interesting features last year, at least, was uh, was Vietnam. Vietnam was the star, as I understand it, in managing COVID. And not now, of course, it's got some problems and it's also slow in the vaccine rollout. But could you give us a bit of a picture as you see it of Indonesia? Uh, first first with you, Mari, and then Tiki, I'll go to you. Thank you. Okay, I'll try to be brief because I really want to have more time uh, uh, for uh, the audience to ask questions. Uh, I think uh, when you look at the depth of the recession last year, uh, uh, Indonesia also experienced negative 2.1%, uh, 2, 2 but it really fared slightly better than other emerging markets. Uh, uh, you know, uh, in, in the whole region, the East Asia region actually managed to grow slightly positive at 1.2 because of China and Vietnam, but other regions like LAC went minus 6.5, uh, South uh, Asia uh, minus 5.3, uh, and so on. So uh, I think we fared better. Uh, and uh, what is the prospect um, for 2021? Uh, the East Asia region, again, is expected to grow at 7.5% uh, in 2021, uh, with China and Vietnam uh, having a real V-shaped recovery uh, of 8.1 and 6.6%. .6%. So these, I don't know about Vietnam's prospects now, but um, this was uh, this uh, projection was made before the, the recent uh, developments in Vietnam uh, and uh, for Indonesia, I think we will still uh, because we still uh, in the first uh, half was still very slow. We're only seeing signs uh, of growth uh, more recently uh, and the vaccine rollout, which started out well, uh, has now been a little bit uh, slower. And partly uh, because we didn't get the AstraZeneca supplies from India that had um, <coughs> uh, that was supposed to come uh, from Serum Institute, but now with Sinovac uh, already approved by WHO, uh, and I think China ramping up uh, its Sinovac production, uh, and maybe AstraZeneca uh, uh, coming uh, back uh, on stream, this uh, may be good signs for Indonesia to have more uh, vaccine rollout. But I think. Uh, most of the uh, uh, projections are, are looking at uh, not uh, for, for the for developing countries, uh, East Asia may be faring a little bit better and uh, not to have like, you know, uh, close to herd immunity, not until the middle of next year, right? So uh, uh, while you can still have uh, increased rollout, uh, uh, even by the end of 21, I don't think we would have high um, uh, herd immunity yet. So uh, the growth is likely to be still dampened. Uh, but at least our projections are showing that Indonesia and Malaysia, remember I, I mentioned earlier in when I was talking about global projections, how a lot of uh, developing economies, even by 2022, would not have reached back the 2019 level. But at least Indonesia is expected to recover back to close to 2019 level in 2021, if it grows um, at around 4.5 to 5 percent, uh, which is the the, the uh, projections uh, by the government and so on. 
um, I think it, the government is 4% something. So uh, that's assuming, right, uh, that you don't have another wave or another variant coming up, another lockdown uh, in, in place. Um, and I think that the, the challenge uh, for Indonesia uh, will be, as with all other countries, as we talked about earlier, uh, uh, dealing with the vaccine rollout and the health uh, issue. But Indonesia has actually benefited from the, the up, upside uh, on the growth of trade. I think Indonesia benefited from the, the recovery in trade, uh, not yet on services, tourism and, and the other services are still down, but at least on goods and also commodity prices uh, bring. Uh, the challenge will be fiscal stimulus. Uh, Indonesia, uh, I think, has a, had a deficit of, um, let's see, what was the deficit number? I think it was five, what was Pretty it, close. five, five, six percent uh, last year. Yeah, okay. yep. for my numbers here, can't find it. Yeah, it was uh, around uh, five, five or six percent uh, last year, and then it's it's going to have to it's going to have to slow down to five percent and then four four percent probably next year, and then three percent by twenty twenty three, right? Because that was that was the agreement. Uh, so uh, uh, I think for Indonesia as well as many other developing countries, given the fiscal space as well as the monetary space. How do you, um, how and when you start winding down your fiscal stimulus and your mon accommodative mar mar monetary policy? You shouldn't do it too soon because it's going to, you know, kill the green shoots of recovery. Uh, and how and what in your limited fiscal space? What do you need to do to make sure that uh, you are uh, uh, utilizing uh, the fiscal space and the monetary accommodative policy in the right way? And obviously this year, you will still need to have social protection system in place. Otherwise poverty rates will go up. It has already gone up. Uh, and it, so it, it will, you, how do you uh, focus on, on social protection uh, and maintaining uh, house, uh, as firms? Uh, what is the support program for firms? Uh, right now it's going mainly uh, through liquidity support that's going through the state banks. Uh, uh, but uh, what about the informal sector? What about the SMEs? And uh, a lot of countries will face this question. Are you going to be in a position to, to rescue either banks? I, 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 actually, the, the, the good news is I think we don't see a huge financial stress uh, in, in the financial sector. Uh, although uh, uh, this is not something you, you should take uh, 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 of course, lightly, uh, th the moment NPLs go up and there's corporate insolvencies, uh, there can be knock-on effects on the banking sector, obviously. Uh, therefore, how do you manage that? And are, are we going to see a lot of insolvencies? Are we going to only see a little? Should we be rescuing companies uh, or not? And who should be rescued? How do you build, have the corporate governance uh, and in place? How do you have the transparency? Uh, and make sure that what you're rescuing are not the zombie firms, but really the firms uh, that actually uh, uh, would, uh, if with, with an injection would, uh, uh, when the economic uh, growth resumes, will be able to create jobs uh, and, and economic growth. Uh, these, are, these are the challenges uh, coming up uh, that uh, countries, including Indonesia, uh, will face. So um, I could say a whole lot more, but uh, maybe I'll stop there uh, and, and uh, I hope for other for questions to come. Okay, thanks very much, Mari. Um, surely, surely Ibu Ani and Pat Perry deserve a big pat on the back for doing a wonderful job in a crisis year. I should have just mentioned, if I may interrupt, um, some shameless promotion. I don't know whether people can see this, but it's um, the latest Indonesia update book from ah. the from the Indonesia project, edited by our esteemed colleagues, Blaine Lewis and Furman Witula. And it's of course on economic dimensions of the COVID-19 in Indonesia, responding to the crisis. Uh, that, that's the end of the shameless promo. Um, <laughs> Mary, one of the puzzling features, no need to respond to this, but I'm still a bit puzzled why Indonesia got off relatively lightly last year, you know, minus 2% contraction when India, uh, Philippines, Thailand had seven, eight, ten percent contraction. Maybe we can come back to that. 
and, and presumably also you'd approve of the temporary uh, unconventional fiscal deficit financing through Bank Indonesia, but, but maybe that's an obvious one. Uh, yeah. So, um, sorry, sorry, Tamari. So, uh, Tiki, can I come to you and then I'm going to open it up for questions. Um, and if I may, starting with the one and only Professor Hugh Patrick, and then I'll go Terry Hull, Titik Anas, uh, and quite a few others. I see Nurul Islani, Ari Pradhana, several more. But uh, Tiki, may I go to you, please, for any comments, uh, additional comments you have on Indonesia in sort of comparative Southeast Asian perspective? Yeah, yeah. Uh, just quickly on Indonesia, I had the privilege actually last week of taking part in a webinar organized by a wonderful group grassroots organization called Gerakan Pakai Masker, GPM. <laughs> and I had the privilege of listening to Professor Pandu Riono from the School of Public Health at the University of Indonesia. We've also so, had him on this series too, Tiki. Okay, okay. So um, Pandu gave me some wonderful highlights. Basically, the title of the webinar was COVID Masih Ada. Okay, so basically he's saying it's still not under control. Okay, actually there have been a 31% increase in the number of deaths between April 20th and the 4th of May. That's eighth in the world behind India. Cases have come down since the peak in January, but still 750 cases per day just in Jakarta. Okay, uh, the decrease in those which are following the 3M, the progress has come down. Okay going back to the social uh, capital issue, partly linked to the, to the mudik, you know, during uh, Lebaran. Pa Pandu mentioned vaccine coverage is still very low. First dose is around five to 7%. Second doses, less than 4%. This is quite recent data and he's done some wonderful informatic uh, analysis on this issue. There is good vaccine coverage among the health workers very important, almost 100%, according to Pandu, but poor coverage in the elderly, around average about 10%. That's the most vulnerable part of the population. And as you know, Indonesia did a shift in the policy from uh, vaccinating productive segment of the population, and now they're saying, let's focus on the elderly. So that's just a snapshot from uh, Pandu on the Indonesian situation. Uh, comparatively to Southeast Asia, it's, you know, obviously it's clear that you can't compare Indonesia and the Philippines, for example, to Singapore or to Thailand because of, of geography, because of logistics capacity, because of uh, social uh, capital issues. But you know, uh, uh, once again, I think there are good lessons from the Singapore experience with the right political will. And Mari's already mentioned uh, vaccine hesitancy, good communication strategies with the right messengers, okay? Uh, not just government officials, not just scientists, community leaders, religious leaders, even celebrities to try and mainstream that, uh, that message. So I'll leave it at that and look forward to some questions. Uh, th thanks very much, uh, Tiki. Uh, including the celebrities, I'll include people like you and Mari, actually. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> so, um, now let's open it up. We have about 25 minutes, so we have plenty of time for discussion. And uh, my first, I'll first invite um, Professor Hugh Patrick, and then I'll go to Terry Hull, and then I'll go to Titik Anas, and then several others. So. Uh, Hugh, uh, good evening. Um, can you uh, can you speak to us? Um, yes. Can you hear me? We uh, can, Hugh, and it's very nice to hear you. And I hope you'll yes. keep well. This is this has been a really, a really impressive uh, uh, set of dis presentations and discussions, and a very sort of analytical and empirical, as well as sort of uh, judgment based. Uh, I guess my question to each of you is, is re really rather simple. Um, uh, and I feel maybe a little shy about that because it's simple compared to all the, the rather sophisticated, comprehensive presentations each of you have made. But uh, uh, Mari, I wanted to ask you, uh, this, you've been speaking quite objectively and analytically. Um, 
Now I want to ask a sort of a subjective question. What do you worry most about for the global economy? And uh, for Tiki Pandestu, I want to ask you, what do you worry most about global health? Thanks very much, Hugh. Uh, if that's subjective, I think it's really important as well. Uh, maybe we'll just take this one and go straight to Mari and Tiki, then we'll come back to the other questioners, since it is such an important question. Uh, Mari, could I go to you first, please, and then Tiki? Mute. Uh, I think you're muted still, Mari. Yeah, for many years, uh, my world and my brother's world were like this. Now it's like... <laughs> <laughs> so what worries me a lot about the global economy is, uh, you know, uh, the pandemic, really, the, the health crisis, because without, without the um, successful uh, containment as well as uh, vaccine rollout, I, I, I really don't, don't see um, uh, that the, world, the, world econ the global economy can recover. So even if advanced economies recover, uh, right now, the global, uh, I think it's, a, I think the number is something like 50 or 50 something percent, maybe close to 60 percent of global economic growth comes from developing countries. So if developing countries uh, are not going to recover or even actually regress, uh, then uh, the world economy will also not, not recover. So that, that's why, you know, when we talk about global cooperation, uh, it is, uh, 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 incumbent upon uh, the advanced economies uh, to uh, to make sure that the vaccine there is equitable uh, access to vaccines because it's not just about you know doing the right thing and helping the people who can access them it is also uh, uh, at the end of the day uh, an, an economic uh, a need as well uh, because without the recovery of these economies which where the demand will come from. Uh, the, the recovery will, uh, the, the global economy is not going to recover. And uh, while we have, uh, like, it looks like a V shape, it could be, people could say it's like the W, it can still go down again. Uh, and this is uh, really my, my big worry. Uh, uh, that's the kind of the short term worry. I have lots of longer term worries because of what we call, what we're, what we're calling permanent scarring on human capital, on, on, uh, on economic assets, on infrastructure, on, on businesses, on, uh, on, on, on capital, um, and not to mention the climate uh, aspects and the natural capital. Those are the longer term worries. Um, and, this, and a lot of, uh, for me, the human capital scarring, that is really going to lead to a lot of inequalities between countries and within countries. And, and really, that is, uh, that is a scary thought, quite frankly. Uh, and, and, and how do we design the, the right kind of policies to, to at least minimize, uh, if we can't uh, offset it, minimize, and then work towards um, uh, addressing uh, how uh, uh, improving the human capital. Because without that, without that, you can't, uh, without that, you can't have the productivity that's going to lead you to growth. Uh, 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 Mari, you didn't mention public debt. That doesn't worry you. These. Oh yes, yes. Sorry, I forgot uh, about that. Sorry. Suppose global yes. interest rates yes. start. Yes. Suppose global interest yes. rates start to rise, which yes. they yes. may yes. well. Uh, won't uh, we have sorry, a, the possibility of that debt crisis as well. Yes, that's that's certainly a big worry, and that's definitely something uh, we, as the World Bank, we have been looking at uh, even before the pandemic. Uh, there were like 60% of uh, developing countries which were already uh, having high a uh, debt overhang. Now with the crisis, uh, 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 the, the, the number of countries that are uh, having uh, debt overhang, uh, increasing, increasing debt overhang as well as uh, serious uh, debt issues is obviously uh, doubling and increasing. Uh, so uh, uh, the, the potential for debt, sovereign debt crisis and corporate debt crisis um, is, is really a huge issue. Uh, and one of the things that we have done in the short term is to come up with what they call a debt service suspension initiative, mm. where official uh, creditors have provided a relief, at least for the, um, for the service pay, to, the, to service the debt, a temporary relief, not, <laughs> not restructuring, just a relief not to ha have to pay. Uh, and it is uh, for the poorest countries, but that's only a Band-Aid. Uh, the real restructuring uh, that needs to happen is really to reduce the debt stock. Mm -hmm. And uh, nobody is uh, at the moment uh, 
coming up with any uh, common solutions yet. But this is uh, the big, big issue. And as you know, even the Pope has, has made a call um, for debt forgiveness, debt restructuring. But this, uh, the, the, the issue, I'll just close on this. The issue is that it's not just um, uh, official creditors. Uh, I think maybe two thirds are private creditors. Mm. So, uh, and, and they are wide in variety from banks to bondholders to vulture funds, hedge funds. Uh, so it's very hard to, to organize like what you did in the 80s with the Brady, uh, Brady restructuring. They, those were only commercial banks and it was mainly US banks. So you could easily do it. But in today's world, it is going to be very difficult to do. Mm. Thanks, Mari. Um, Tiki, over to you, please. I suspect that Mari might have actually answered you, the question for you too, but Tiki, we'd be interested in any comments you have, please. Yeah, she has. And uh, what worries me most about global health, um, I worked for the WHO for 13 years, and I'm driven every day when I enter the office building in Geneva by the motto of the mission of the WHO. And it reads, the highest possible level of health for all people. So for me, the pandemic, what worries me most about global health, inequity, social justice, and human rights. Mm. I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Tiggy, very well put. Uh, next, I'd like to go to my near neighbor in Aranda. Uh, that's Professor Terry Hull. Terry, over to you, Pat. Thank you very much. Uh, really appreciate the uh, wonderful organization of the Indonesia project to put on these Zoom webinars. And it's wonderful to see Mari and Tiki, uh, though from great distances. I have really only one question for Tiki about the uh, source of the COVID-19 virus and how uh, that has become such a political issue. Australia uh, did raise the issue about uh, researching the source and had a lot of pushback from China. We see that there's a lot of conflict between national politicians undermining cooperation on vaccines and treatments. So how important is it for us to know where the COVID-19 virus came from and will it help us to deal with a future pandemic. Thanks very much. Thanks, Terry. Uh, so, uh, Tiki, would you like to comment on that? Yes, uh, very briefly, I've been asked this question many times. Uh, for me, from a public health, from a global health perspective, uh, dealing with the current crisis is the priority. Um, obviously, scientifically, academically, it would be good to try and um, determine the source or the origin of the virus. But I can tell you, uh, I used to be a microbiologist in my past life, that to actually get a definitive answer on this, it's going to be almost impossible. Yes, of course, there are possibilities of laboratory leakages, laboratory accidents that has happened many times in the past. But as Terry, you mentioned, it has become a very sort of uh, a political issue. So for me, I think the, the demands on WHO to, to, re, to do yet another investigation, I think, you know, obviously the, the, the organization has to respond to that. But unfortunately, I believe it's an opportunity because when so many more resources and, and, and brain power could be uh, dealt with, uh, could be used to deal with the ongoing crisis in so many parts of the world. But sure, academically, scientifically, uh, whatever comes out of this investigation uh, can be, you know, uh, uh, be used to prevent uh, uh, future pandemics uh, from happening. So I'll leave it at that view. Um, uh, 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 Tiki, I don't, I don't want to put you on the spot, Tiki, but are you saying that we may never really know the precise origins of the of the of the pandemic from Wuhan, if it is yes. Wuhan? Yes, that's what I'm saying, because there are so many other possibilities. Uh, for example, the idea that the virus actually first appeared in, in Europe, for example, uh, in November of, of 2019. Um, the possibility of um, animal origins that we haven't even talked about, you know, uh, bats, not just in China, but in different parts of the world. So, you know, how much manpower, how much scientific resources are going to be needed to, uh, to try 
to answer what for me is an unanswerable question. I mean, that's just my own personal view as a microbiologist. Mm. I think it's a fundamentally important observation, actually, because so many politicians, sadly, including some here in this country, use it as a kind of, you know, an opportunity to, you know, attack China, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Okay. I mean, I think, I think what, what, what is beyond doubt is the animal origins, and, and Mari has already uh, alluded to that. It, it's very well known, a wonderful survey over pandemics in the last 60 years that 70% of those pandemics originated in a, a zoonotic or animal origin. So that's beyond doubt, but the details mm. of that still remains a bit murky. What's the intermediate host, for example? Mm. I better not go on about that. No, that <laughs> thank you, it's very, very interesting, Vicky. Uh, okay, now let me go next to Dr. Titik Anas uh, in beautiful Bandung. Uh, hi, Titik. By the way, after Titik, I'll go to our good friend Ari Peradana in, uh, in Manila. Uh, both, by the way, uh, <laughs> uh, were sent to ANU by Dr. Mari Pangestu. <laughs> uh, Titik, over to you, please. Thank you very much, Hal. Uh, I like to ask uh, both Pa Tiki and Ibu Mari on uh, resolving the issue of supply side constraint. As Ibu Mari already mentioned earlier, and you also Hal, that uh, the scarcity of vaccine are going to lead to inequality, and that's going to be uh, affecting the human capital development, especially in the poor and developing countries. So this is kind of humanity crisis that we are going to face in the next few years. So I'm wondering first on the global cooperation, while the fund being uh, devoted by um, a global uh, community is only like 10 times the Indonesia spend on its vaccine at market price. So it's not going to be sufficient. While um, um, as Patiki mentioned, um, relinquishing the copyrights of the private sector's um, uh, vaccine development is also not a good idea. So what is the way forward? So we can prevent this humanity crisis, uh, human development crisis in the future. Um, should we, although I think uh, the copyrights is the right to, to respect the innovation, how we, uh, uh, we, we attain or achieve balance between uh, supporting innovation and also solving the uh, uh, human capital capital development crisis. Um, that's uh, for Ibu Mari and Patiki, specifically for Patiki, if, uh, when you mentioned that we should increase the local uh, production uh, for countries who have not yet produced vaccine itself, uh, and we know that developing vaccine takes years, how can we increase the production? Pa? So those two, Hal, thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much, Titik. Both very important questions. Uh, just keeping an eye on the time, I wonder, I might now go also to Ari Peradana, and then we'll come back to Mari and Tiki. Uh, Ari, can you hear us okay? And Salamat, yes. Salamat Pagi de Manila, yeah? I guess you're in Manila, or maybe you're somewhere else. No, um, stay in Manila, uh, stuck in Manila, uh, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> it, it's not nice to hear from you. Please go ahead. Yes. Yeah, terima kasih, Pak Hal. Um, sent to ANU by Bumeri. That's a um, very accurate uh, uh, description. <laughs> uh, nice to... Korban <laughs> beliau. Yeah, nice, nice to uh, hear Bumeri and Pak Tiki today. So on social capital, uh, I think Pak Tiki Bumeri mentioned it several times, and I agree this was a very inter uh, important and interesting variable for us to test the effectiveness of the measures and you know uh, the spread of the pandemic. But... Uh, to my, I think rather than concluding that people not having social capital or, or social responsibility, I, I see this as a conflict between different forms of social capital. Because I know that in Indonesia, in India, Malaysia, and also to some extent in the USA, uh, people broke the quarantine to attend religious ceremonies, to, to do group exercises, or just to maintain relationship by visiting each other in, in Hari Raya. 
So people clearly value social capital and they are afraid to, 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 to face social punishment if they don't you know, go to such ceremonies uh, or gatherings. Uh, and this exceeds the fear of being infected or infecting others. So I think the question is why this happens. And I, I, we don't, I don't think we have the answer right now, but this may be a good research uh, you know, uh, questions. But uh, maybe partly it's, it's also due to the message from the government or the authority, the, the, the incon consistent or inconsistent messages and, and enforcement may, may, you know, may have the endogenous effect on how people uh, behave uh, during the pandemic. So I think in Indonesia, we used to have good um, public health message. Remember, keluarga berencana dua anak cukup. Remember the campaign of Pekan Immunisasi Nasional, and we didn't see that, uh, you know, uh, during this pandemic or even prior to this pandemic, uh, you know, that led to the low uh, take up of, of vaccines. So maybe the, the, the specific question uh, to Patike and Bumeri, what, what can we learn from this? And specifically to Bumeri, what can we in international development partners learn from this situation? Terima kasih, Pak. Uh, th thanks, Ari. I should have mentioned Ari is, uh, works for the Asian Development Bank uh, as well. <laughs> so yes. uh, uh, can I go to you, Mary, first and then to Tiki? Uh, by the way, sorry to be rude, but you please feel free to keep your answers short because I see more questions coming in. Uh, sorry about that. Um, thanks, uh, Mary, to you first and then to Tiki, please. And I think you're on mute still, Mary. Yes, I'll try to be brief and Titi and Ari, we can take it offline if you're not satisfied. Uh, yes, so that's that. an option as well. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, basically on, on in a, you know, we, we supply, supply is a big issue uh, apart from the equitable uh, distribution of what exists. But I think in the short term, what we are calling for is greater transparency. And uh, the World Bank has now uh, put all the contracts that we have uh, with the countries that we are working with on a website where everybody can see because you want to know the pricing you want to know how much and who's uh, providing what this is actually much needed because that will determine how much uh, it, what what's the shortage what's the shortfall that you need to invest in second uh, we are calling of obviously for the advanced countries uh, that have actually booked most of the production for this year uh, to be able to share the vaccines once they've uh, vaccinated their own uh, population and that it should go through the multilateral facility or uh, directly bilaterally uh, with, with countries. Uh, and that, that needs to happen. And then third, on the investment side, it has to be ramped up and it should be done in a way uh, which is not just uh, the IPR waiver because you do need uh, to be able to have the manufacturing cap capability, the technology, uh, the equipment, the raw material, the supply chain, these are not things that you can create overnight. So I think uh, going uh, the, the short term easiest way is to expand existing license facilities and uh, provide investment flows into them. And IFC, which is the World Bank private sector arm, is actually looking at, at a number of potential investments to ramp it up and to make sure that there are no uh, trade restrictions, both on the import of raw materials and being able to export from that hub uh, to other countries. And, and, uh, and I already explained the regional distribution on that. On social capital, uh, I think um, uh, we were look, I was looking at it more like the importance of communities and social capital to actually enforce good behavior. Uh, and also to, to uh, a lot of times they're also, uh, uh, when you don't have data, they can also identify who are the poor people who need assistance. Uh, and we have been using community uh, based. So uh, basically what the bank did was work with, with government and then work with, uh, through government, but uh, the delivery is by community based uh, organizations. Like we delivered 225 million to 225 million women through a, a women's self-help uh, program in India, for instance. So that, that I would say that's the power of a positive aspect of, of uh, social capital. Uh, and uh, on the communication side, uh, as Tiki also already mentioned, tokoh tokoh, the religious leaders uh, or the uh, tokoh masyarakat in each of these communities play a very important role to enforce behavioral change, but they need to have the right uh, messaging. So I, I believe uh, Indonesia, I remember looking at the vaccination plan of Indonesia, 
religious leaders was actually one of the priority groups uh, to be vaccinated. Uh, but you asked me uh, what ADB and uh, World Bank should be doing. We, we are actually looking at how uh, we can use social capital to have better communication, but they need to be equipped uh, with, with the right information. And the government obviously has to uh, work with these relig religious leaders too. I think at the moment, two important things. One is to reduce vaccine hesitancy. Uh, and second, uh, to, to provide the correct information uh, uh, you know, vaccines, yes, uh, you still have to do containment, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, uh, still practice uh, a good behavior in terms of uh, social distancing and so on. Mm. Thanks, uh, Mary. Uh, Tiki, would you like to comment? And you're uh, muted. You're muted still, Tiki. Sorry, just uh, briefly, uh, Titi. Uh, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that every country should develop its own manufacturing capacity. That's clearly uh, you know, not feasible. However, um, I think what is important here is the larger uh, lower or middle income countries like Indonesia could be sort of uh, their local capacity could be enhanced, for example, by the government providing more resources, not just to Bio Pharma, but perhaps even to some national pharmaceutical companies. They have that capacity, okay, providing incentives. So if you promote local enhanced vaccine production in Indonesia, that could be helpful to other countries in the region, which may not want to develop their own manufacturing uh, industry. So I leave it at that to Titik's question. Um, the other question on social capital, I fully agree with Firman that people value certain uh, social uh, uh, norms and, and, and uh, traditions, and that overcomes their fear. But you also mentioned that it's important that is the messages are given in the right format by the right people so that they will then see this in a more balanced way. Okay, yes, you need, I mean, we acknowledge that you want to maintain these traditions, but we also want you to be more socially uh, responsible. Um, Mari mentioned uh, in the, uh, previously the importance of advances in data analytics. I just did a webinar with a group which is doing some wonderful uh, work around comp computational lingu linguistics and social data analytics. And one of the interesting findings is that they found that messages being sent by politicians, by experts, by scientists are less likely to resonate with the people compared to messages that come from people that they can relate to. Someone who looks like them, someone who talks like them. And they also found that messages that promote moral obligation tends to have very little effect compared to messages that say protection, hope, gratitude. So that's, that's a quick answer to the two questions. Thank you. Uh, th uh, thanks very much, Tiki. Uh, so we're just about out of time. Um, if I may seek your indulgence for five more minutes, if that's okay, Acho and Nook, and, and also Tiki and Murray, there are just some more questions. I'll just read them out if, if, if you don't mind. <laughs> You don't need to respond if, if you don't wish, but just to let you know what they are. So you'll know some of them. Um, Professor Anne Booth in London. Hi, Anne. It must be pretty late in London. Maybe you're a, a night owl. Huh? So Anne says, if you don't mind, Anne, I'll just read it uh, since time is short. Anne says, even if more vaccines can be produced in Indonesia, will the government be able to manage the complex logistics of delivery to over 180 million people. There are puskis mass in every kachamatan, but many are understaffed. Some even lack fridges, so storage would be difficult. Can they cope? And if not, uh, are there other facilities to fill the gap, especially rural areas? That's from Anne. Thanks, thanks, Anne. Important question. Another one is from uh, an anonymous attendee. Uh, please don't be shy, but we'll take anonymous attendees as well. Uh, and the, the anonymous ten attendee asks, are there any insights on how COVAX is allocating and distributing the vaccine? What is their decision-making process like to determine how much vaccine supply the developing country should get and who should get it first? That's 
obviously a very important question too. And just one more, if I can find it. It's from uh, Nurul uh, is Isnani, and Nurul asks um, how to empower WHO in global vaccine governance, while business and powerful private organisations have control the institutional mechanism and big countries are reluctant to show their global leadership because of vaccine nationalism and so on. And then related, how's the role of multilateral institutions, especially the World Bank, to facilitate more equal opportunities for certain developing countries? Uh, it goes on a bit longer, but that's the gist of it. And some of it has been uh, covered already. Do you want to just perhaps each of you, if I may, back to Mari Antigi, just just a couple of minutes, just any summary remarks, those particular questions or anything else you'd like to say. Uh, Tiki, could I start with you, please? Yes, very quickly. I will leave the COVAX allocation question to Mari, so he's much more familiar with this. Obviously, I agree with Anne Booth that uh, logistics, transport, et cetera, is going to be the main challenge, especially to the far-flung regions of Indonesia. Uh, let me just focus on Nurul's question. How do you empower WHO? Um, obviously, you know, I'm a little bit uh, less objective about this since I used to work uh, for WHO and I'm still very passionate in the role of WHO. Just two personal views about how you would empower WHO. Firstly, give it more money, okay? As we mentioned, the budget is the same budget as a medium-sized US hospital. Give it more money, give it independence to decide what to do with that money. 80% of the WHO budget comes from so-called earmark contributions, mm -hmm. where the WHO is obliged to spend the funds only in the areas that the donor is requesting. Mm -hmm. So more money, less earmarking. The second one, you need to reform the governance of the WHO. At the moment, the board of directors of WHO are the member states, sovereign states. Global health is a lot more beyond countries, okay? You need, for example, the pharmaceutical industry. See what happened with the COVID vaccines. That would not have happened. So they should be part of the governance. Civil society, okay, philanthropies, you need to reform the governance of the WHO. That's going to be aspirational. Countries, as I know in my 13 years with the WHO, are very protective to protect their sovereignty. I'll leave it at that, Hal. Thank you, Tiggy. That's a great way to end. Thanks a lot. Uh, Mary, Hal, 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 let, let me just finish on yes, a quotation uh, that I hear, because going back to your uh, initial question about what will the future looks like, Okay, mm. I can't resist quoting this. Yes, please. I saw a quote from uh, Mahmoud Ende. Okay, our ministry, our coordinating minister for law, security, and uh, I can't remember the other one. Okay, and he said, the coronavirus is like your wife. You think you can control it, then you realize you can't. So now you have to live with it. You have to learn how to live with it. Thank you. Yes, that's an unconventional quote, <laughs> <I didn't, laughs> but, but we get the message very clearly. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, Mari, uh, over to you for any concluding comments uh, generally or those specific points. And you're still muted, I think, Mari. This is the problem with uh, these webinars. Um, let me quickly respond uh, to Anne and the COVAX question. And I agree with you, but I think we have quite a, what would you say, innovative uh, health minister. He's uh, basically reaching out uh, to, to many, many stakeholders to help uh, distribute the vaccine. Uh, for instance, I give you, you talk about storage delivery and refriger refrigeration. I know that he reached out to Unilever and Unilever has repurposed its ice cream fridges to uh, be able to uh, store the, the vaccines. And you know, Unilever is, uh, goes to the PLOSOC, they go to the, the very, very uh, the small rural areas. And he's working, and private sector can now actually also deliver the vaccine. The army, uh, the armed forces uh, are also involved. So it, tra you have to train, of course, a, a lot of people. Uh, uh, on COVAX, the idea was that they should be doing advanced purchases, including uh, also they work with SEPI 
who is doing the research side so that you know the idea is that you have a pool of uh, vaccines that potentially will become available you know some will fail some will be succeeding uh, and then uh, the, there are 92 very poor countries of which they will be given uh, for free 20% of the first uh, 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 need for that population. And then there are other countries that can buy uh, from, uh, from COVAX. But you know, for poor countries, 20, first 20% for free, and then after that, they can also buy from COVAX. But at the moment, uh, COVAX also uh, experiencing problems with supply. Uh, and and uh, this is where the transparency of contracts uh, become an issue. But they, I would say they are still, uh, as a multilateral uh, platform, uh, a good way to, to be able to distribute uh, equitably. Um, I will just close by thanking all of you. Uh, I wish we had more time. I think these are really big issues. Uh, and, uh, and I, I actually uh, agree with uh, the quote that Tiki ended with, you know, we will have to learn to live uh, with this uh, virus. Uh, it's not going to go away anytime soon. We need to, you know, uh, adjust the way we live, the way we work uh, uh, to, to adapt uh, to, to the existence of this pandemic. And I think what will happen uh, in the near future is that uh, we will continue to work like this hybrid, you know, the hybrid way uh, of working. Uh, and there's uh, opportunities in there uh, also. Uh, uh, and, and the delivery of many things through digital technology is, is actually uh, can be a plus. But uh, you know, many, many other development issues uh, that we must face uh, at the same time. And I hope that um, we will have another, another seminar, uh, uh, maybe in a year's time, uh, to review where we are. <laughs> Okay, uh, on that on that sort of slightly hopeful note, uh, unfortunately, we've got to wrap up. We're already over time. Uh, this has been an absolutely wonderful webinar session, um, and it's been wonderful because we've had two wonderful guests, uh, Mari and Tiki. Uh, our deepest thanks to both of you. I mean, you speak with such authority and such insights, and you're able to cover not just the big picture, but also the micro picture, and not just the sort of your specialist fields of health and economics, but the sort of public policy, political economy interaction. So uh, it's been such, a, such, a, uh, such an enjoyable, uh, lively session. So our deepest thanks to both of you, Maria Tiki. I wouldn't dare to try and summarize, but I've made notes all the way through and sometime I, I might have a go because there's so much we've learned from you. And um, Mari, definitely, you're booked up, if that's okay, with Tiki as well. You're, you're booked up. We, we'd have you every week if we could, but that's a bit unrealistic. But um, if you're available, we'd love to book you up again for whenever, next year or sometime. But thank you both very much. Uh, we really appreciate it, especially Mari, for you staying up late, and Tiki getting up uh, rather early as well in Singapore. Um, so thank you so much. It's lovely to see you both. Thank you, thank you Hal, and thank you, thank everybody. You, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Bumari. Thank you, Patiki. You're both looking very well, by the way. So thank, thank you, you, Hal. Thank you. Bumari. Yeah. Bye. 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 Can I hand back to Acho and Nuke, please? Yeah. Yes, thank you very much, Hal, uh, for helping us. Again, thank you, Ibu Mary. Thank you, Patiki. And sorry again, Ibu Mary, to keep you awake <laughs> at this <That's> time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and sorry to Patiki about the time arrangement that there was a glitch in our organization of this. No problem, no problem. Thanks. So and great. thank you for all the participants also. You, you see, if you didn't have this facil this way of uh, having a webinar, you would not have had Anne Booth in London and Hugh Patrick in New York joining. I mean, these are like really our old friends. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. exactly. Very good. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 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 Thank, thank you. Bye. Thank you, thank you, Thank you, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to all the. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you. Lovely to see you, too. Yeah, and everybody else. Good to see you. Ada Mas Haryo. 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 How are you long term? Selamat, yeah? yeah. And selamat how, ulang tahun dan selamat hari lansia, Mas Haryo. <laughs> Haryo, you become a fashionista. Your batik looks really fancy. Hmm, betul. Keceh, keceh pokoknya. 
Mas Harry, are you muted? You can say something. Come and talk to us, are you? Ya, ya, ya. Ini patek warisan dari orang tua saya. Wow. 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 Yeah. Berarti langsing ya orang tuanya Mas Aryo, <laughs> langsing Mas Aryo. Kain dikasihnya kain saya cai. Oh ala, I see. And I, I, I think the biggest thanks goes to Pak Hal here. He he's not uh, he's not very well actually this morning, but he keeps oh. going. So yes. semoga cepat sembuh Pak Hal. Oh, terima kasih banyak. He, oh, yes. Kosong saja my special thing. Uh, tidak terdengar sakit sama sekali. Uh, Very no. lively hal. <laughs> ada tamu-tamu yang terhormat, they made all the difference, ya. Yeah? Uh, jadi langsung sehat ya, Hal. Yeah, I'm fine really. And selamat to the great Indonesia project team, you know. Iya, yeah, keren, keren banget nih, Aco. Thank you, Pak. Thank you semuanya. Thank you attendance. I can see now as, as si Pak Pandu Riono is there. Andre Suryanta is there. Thank you so much everyone. And many others. Yes, thank you, thank you so much, Pak Pandu, uh, for you know um, joining this right from the beginning. And he was being uh, quoted juga ya tadi. Yeah. <laughs> right. So yeah. we have a booking in one year's time, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great. Okay. Okay. Bye. Selamat pagi semuanya. Yeah. Bye. 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 Bye.